Welcome to our Faith Family Church broadcast. My name is Stanley Scott II. I'm the senior pastor here in Houston, Texas at Faith Family Church. I'm so excited that you've joined us today to receive this message from the Lord. So as we get into this message, let me encourage you, write down these scriptures, take some notes, and get ready to experience a better life than the one you've been living. my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I do what it tells me to do. And I love my Bible. So I make this as a confession. And I will meditate therein. Both day and night. On a chapter in the morning. And a chapter in the evening. And because I do. My life is blessed. It is no more a mess. Now everything I touch, everything I touch, now turns to success. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Amen. And put your hands together and welcome everybody joining us live. Welcome to our Faith Family Church broadcast. Grab a Bible, follow along with us in these scriptures, and get ready to experience a better life than the one that you've been living. Amen. Go ahead and bow your heads with me and let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this, another opportunity to meditate your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. We ask you to shine the light of your word to us today. Help us to see this great revelation, this message from your throne to our hearts. Let not one of us leave confused or misunderstanding in any way. Let us all be changed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Open with me, if you would, in your Bible to the book of Amos chapter 3. Amos, the third chapter. And we're going to look at one verse of Scripture. We're starting a brand new series. And as it is, God always gives us a foundational Scripture to follow throughout the whole series. In other words, at the end of how many ever weeks this takes, we should have a better understanding, a comprehension of this verse or these verses of Scripture. Amen? Well, in Amos chapter 3, verse 3, the Bible says this, Can two walk together unless they are agreed? What's the answer to that question? What's the answer to that question? I mean, can, can two people walk and get out of this room if they were tied together and agree to something. No, if they don't agree, they'll never leave this room. Imagine if two people were handcuffed and one wanted to go out of this door and the other one wanted to go out of that door. They may not ever make it out the room unless somebody agreed to the other one or somebody's going to be drugged. Amen. Well, we're starting a brand new series today that we want to call... What kind of church are we? And we also are going to look at what kind of person are you? Now, if you're a first time visitor, uh, first of all, we want to welcome you. We want to thank you for being here. Um, But if you're a first time visitor to Faith Family Church, then you might be wondering and might have been wondering, what kind of church is this? You know, maybe you were invited by a friend or maybe you saw a sign or maybe you Googled and and are new in the area. Well, it's good to find out what kind of church um, that you're attending. Amen. You know, they say don't judge a book by its cover. Anybody ever heard that? Well, I believe you shouldn't judge a church by its location. What kind of church is meeting in a school or what kind of church is that, you know, I I don't believe you should judge a church by its amenities. You know, the amenities of a hotel are the different things that they have that that are for your benefit or, or for your advantage. I believe you shouldn't even judge a church by its color. Ooh, it's quiet in this church. You know, so oftentimes, I, I believe with all my heart that Sunday morning is still the most segregated hour in the United States of America. 
where you've got white people that go to white churches and black people to go to black churches and Hispanic people that go to Hispanic. I ain't getting no amens on this. And Asian people that go to Asian churches. I don't think you should judge a church by its location, by its amenities, by its color. I believe you should judge it by its core values. Amen. Amen. So we're going to talk today, and this series is about core values. Core values are the fundamental beliefs of a person or organization. So when you're talking about the core value of an individual or a organization, you're talking about what's very important to that that person or to that organization. So we're just going to spend some time over the next several weeks talking about this particular subject. Now, these are guiding principles that dictate behavior and can help people to understand the difference between right and and wrong. You know, my mother taught me this early in life, and it's a lesson that I'll never forget. She taught me to understand a person's philosophies of life. I mean, if you're going to be in a serious relationship with someone, you want to take time before you make a commitment to understand their philosophies of life. You all know what I mean by philosophies of life? I mean, you know, essentially... It, the, the way they think about life in general. You know, what you'll find, I mean, they, she might be cute on the outside. But you want to find and understand, you know, certain philosophies, certain outlooks, certain things that are really, really important to that other person before you enter into uh, a relationship with that person. And I, I know for me, and as a young man, before I ever got married, you know, she taught me about understanding a person's philosophies of life. You know, especially if you're going to be in a marriage relationship. Why? Because people don't change for other people. They might change for a moment. They may try to put, you know, a, 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 up a certain front. But ultimately, over time, they will revert to being who they are. And so you want to have a good understanding because people, um, uh, people will change. People don't change who they are for other people. Now, people will change who they are when they experience God in a meaningful way. How many of you are better than you've been? I mean, you're changed. You're a different person. Than you used to be. Well, I submit to you, in many, many cases, you didn't make that change for somebody else. Ultimately, you experienced God in a very meaningful way. You saw something about you that needed to change, and you made that adjustment. Very rarely do people change for other people. I want you to look at this. I want to be able to tie this into Amos chapter 3. I want to look at it in different translations. In verse... Three in the New Living, it says this. Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? You know, again, if if we're going to be so-called walking together, then we've got to agree on the direction that we're going in. The moment I go one way and you go another, then we're no longer walking together. Amen. And, and what happens is because of our core values, because of our outlook on life, uh, it determines whether we end up walking together or walking apart. Um, notice this in the next translation. Um, the NIV says, do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so. In other words, in advance, before they ever set out to do anything, they agreed that they were going to do something. And then the next uh, translation says, do two people walk hand in hand if they're if they aren't going to the same place? What's the answer to that question? Again, if they're not going to the same place, there's no way they could be hand in hand together. And so oftentimes in life, especially in marriage relationships, work relationships, family relationships and even in the church, Agreement is so very, very important. And so we want to take the time um, to, um, if you could you show me what that is. So we want to take a time 
to look at that. If you're going to be in a serious relationship with someone, then you need to get to know who they are. Amen. And so we want to, it's our heart here at Faith Family Church, we want you to know who we are as a people and what kind of church as we, uh, at the, what kind of church are we? Amen. And then at the same time, while you all are examining us, then we want to be able to ask the same question. Then what, at, want to challenge you with the same question. What kind of person are you? And the reason why we're doing that is because people don't change who they are for other people. Amen. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 14, the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness? How many have ever heard this verse of scripture? Come on, show of hands. Now, the Bible says very clearly to not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I'd like to do some double duty. If you are an unmarried person, then you need to pay particular attention to this. Because can two walk together except they be in agreement? Well, yes, unless one is dragging the other person. And what I've seen often through life is that one person is dragging the other one through life. Whether it be on the job, whether it be in the home, whether it be in, you know, in work relationships, whatever it is, if you're not in agreement, then that means, if you're going in that direction, that means you've submitted to it and you're going against your will. Well, how do you get to that place of being able to go together in agreement? You take time to find out what's, what, what this person's make of it. What is their, their core values? Amen. You know, Maya Angelou made a statement. Oprah Winfrey has co- quoted it so much. You know, I know it's not a scripture, but in life I've learned this to be so important to understand. When someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. People know themselves much better than you do. That's why it's important to stop expecting them to be something other than who they are. So we're going to be looking at who are we as a church. But understand this, in life, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them the first time. See, if if you're dating somebody and uh, they slip and say something, they slip and do something, who is quiet? When a person shows you a part of their true self, Don't just, well, no, they just had a bad day at work. (laughs) Oh, no, you know, you know, that that was just and you've made excuse after excuse and allowance after allowance. And then you find yourself connected and involved with somebody that at their core values things differently in life than you do. So when a person shows you who they are, believe it, uh, believe them. So we want to over the next several weeks, take some time. Um, To let you know who we are as a church, because we want to be in a serious relationship with you. We want to challenge you at the same time to examine who you are and endeavor to be a better person. So in other words, while we're defining what kind of church we are, we want you and I'm challenging you to be the same kind of individual. Amen. So we're going to look at three different things today in terms of what kind of church are we. Number one, we are a word church. Say it out loud. We are a word church. Now, remember, this is twofold. We're talking about what kind of church are we? We're going to look at the things that are most valuable to faith family church. What we hold in high esteem. In other words, and we're going to do this as best we can. But number one can never be anything less than number one. So what we say is our number one and and, and number two and number three. When we look at these, these are the things that you could say of all the things, this all the things that this church values. They value this above all others. What we're also challenging you to do while we go through this series is to examine yourself and ask yourself the question, what kind of person am I? 
who am I? As we ask, who are we? Because I'm challenging you from number one, just like I'm about to say, we are a word church. You ought to be able to say, I am a word person. Of all the things I personally value in life, I value the word of God more than anything and everything. Now, not everybody is a word person. I want to challenge you to be. And not every church is a word church. So, for example, we are technically a non-denominational congregation. We're an independent church. We are not connected to any denomination um, uh, that, that, that's no, we're technically non-denominational. We're not a part of or a plant of another church. I'm the founding pastor and senior pastor of the church. Amen. And that means I hear from heaven and I obey what God says. Amen. That I don't have to go by a certain denominational rule, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in many different denominations, you'll have a Baptist denomination. You'll have a Pentecostal denomination. There are charismatic denominations. There are uh, Episcopal denominations. I mean, you could just name them. Church of God of Christ. All of those are different kinds of churches. Um, there, there are a kind of church that are called word churches. And particularly in those churches, they make a big emphasis of the word of God. Some, not all churches are word churches. What do you mean by that? Some churches are comfortable taking one verse of scripture and breaking it down very good for the 28 or 48 minutes that they preach. Amen. At this church, we're going to look at some scriptures. Why is that? I'm about to show you from the word of God. It is because we above all things are a word church. Where do we get that from? In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus said this. He said, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, come on, word that does what? Proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, you know, God can't speak from heaven. When Jesus was baptized, heaven opened and they heard a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. How many of y'all remember reading that in the Bible? Now, God can speak from heaven, but the Bible says when Jesus ascended on high, when he was raised from the dead, he gave gifts unto men, some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Those are his mouthpieces in the earth. So when this verse says that God, uh, that, that man can't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God, we're not just talking about you hearing directly from heaven, but hearing directly from heaven through the gifts that he has given. Amen? Amen. So now notice he said, man shall not live by bread alone. But most people in the world live their lives on bread and water alone. Or, or food and, 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 and drink. They get no word from heaven. Man, I'm not getting enough amens on this. But this is really good. Amen. Matter of fact, if you could back up, I, I just want to emphasize. Notice he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Somebody say every word. Every word that proceeds from God. Now, just like you feed your body more than one time a day. Come on, be honest. How many of y'all, be honest, you eat something more than once a day? Amen. Okay, that's most of us if we're going to vote. Amen. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely going to eat something this afternoon. <laughs> I'm a snacker. I'm, I kind of graze all throughout the day. <laughs> well, but if, if all the words you get is a 30, 40, 50 minute message on the Sunday that you come, then your spirit being will be undernourished, undernourished and very weak. Jesus made this statement, and for this reason, we make sure that when you come, if the sound doesn't go right, if the, come on now, if the video doesn't go right, if I don't get my, my introduction right, if it doesn't flow the way, hey, by the end of the day, you're going to see some scripture 
from the Word of God. Amen? Amen. In Mark chapter 4, this is another major part of our belief. In, in Mark chapter 4, verse 13, Jesus told us a parable. In verse 13, he said this. The, um, he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand what? All parables. Now, how many of y'all know Jesus taught the people, which is us, in parables? You know, the kingdom of heaven is like a man that planted a seed in the ground. And he went to bed and he, and he woke up and he didn't know how it grew. But it, it, I mean, I mean y'all know. Notice he said, he's, he's telling them a parable. And about this one parable, he said, if you don't understand this parable, then how will you understand all parables? In other words, this is the grand master key to every parable that Jesus ever preached. So this is the granddaddy of all parables, one in which you must comprehend. So what is that parable? It is in verse 14, the sower sows the word. Now, prior to this, he gave the parable to the multitude, but now he's breaking the parable down to the people. To the to the disciples. And he's saying that guy that I was telling you about that went out and scattered seed on the ground. He's the sower and the seed that he's scattering is the word of God. Right now, while I'm preaching this morning to hundreds of people, I am scattering the seed of the word of God. Now, watch what happens. Watch, watch what Jesus says happens to the seed of the word of God. In verse 15, he says, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, when, when they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Notice this. He said this first group are the ones that are sown by the wayside where the word, somebody say the word. The word. So they hear the word, but when they hear it, Satan comes immediately and he takes away the what? Word. The word that was sown. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means is going to happen at the end of this service? Come on, y'all talk to me now. Can y'all hear me in the back? Can y'all hear me in the front? What that means is by the end of this day, this message that you are hearing it, the enemy is going to cr- try to take it away from you. Well, I don't know if I'm going to be there next week because I don't really know what this series is all about. <laughs> By the end of this day, you're going to have an opportunity for whatever word was sown to be taken away from you. And, uh, and sadly, there will be some of us that, that, you know, if we don't hold on to that word, he'll be able to get it away from us. Notice the next one. He says, these are likewise the ones that are sown on stony ground who, when they hear the what word, immediately they receive it with gladness. I mean, right now, some of you all are getting excited because you're a word person and you're like, hmm, that's good. I'm a word person. So go ahead and preach that word, pastor. <laughs> but notice this group, they received the word they, they heard. But verse six seventeen says. And they have no root in themselves and they only hold on to that word for a period of time. Afterward, when some hard trouble or some pressure comes up for the word's sake, immediately they do what? So if you find yourself cussing somebody out by Tuesday, that means you got excited about God. You gave us a good word. Yeah, I'm a word person. But then the enemy is trying to get that word out of you, right? So he comes and have somebody step on your toes. Come and have somebody say something or move something or eat some of your food, right? And all of a sudden you find yourself stumbling or offended. Then there's another group in verse 18. Now these are the ones uh, sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the what? The The word. Now notice, I mean, if... For no other reason, in every one of these verses, it's the word, the word, the word. What's important to God is the word. And I pray that you'll see that. So we may not have the best choir. 
We may not have the best singing. We may not have the best, the, 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 the best setup. We may not have the best children's ministry. But above all things, how many of y'all know we need to get a good word? Now, great singing, excellent children's ministry, all the other systems and functions of ministry are very important to ministry. But how many of y'all know number one needs to be number one? We need to make sure when we go to church, we are taking something home with us. Now, these are the ones sown among thorns who hear the word. So these are people who came to church. They heard the word, verse 19, and the cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, desire for other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And then verse 20, he says, the fourth group are those, the ones Sown on good ground, those who hear, help me out, the word, accepted and bear fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. How many of y'all see how important it is for a church to be a word church? That, you know, thank God if I have an ability to preach and to communicate well, but above all things, I need to make sure that I give you what God is saying through his word. Amen. Amen. Now, what's what's unique about Mark chapter four is that there's four groups. Twenty five percent of them lose it the same day. Another twenty five percent of them hold it for a little bit of time. A third twenty five percent of them. The word gets choked out and it's never productive. So for 75 percent of the people that hear the word of God, they are unproductive. This is what Jesus said. Let's go back over this. 100 percent of the people, the word was sown, but 25 of them were and Satan took it away immediately. They left and they were like, what was that? I didn't get nothing out of church today. Right? The other 25%, they were excited about it, but then they let it go when the enemy came. The third group, they got it, but because of other things going on, the word never really produced what it could produce. I wonder if this could explain why 75 percent of the body of Christ is not experiencing financial wealth or peace like they should. I wonder if this could explain why 75 percent of the body of Christ struggles in the area of healing. I wonder if this could. I'm preaching better than y'all are saying. Amen. Give me a little more microphone. Come on. I wonder if this could explain why 75 percent of the body of Christ struggles in their relationships. But then there is a group who hear the word of God. They press it down deep into their heart. How did they do that? They do that by reading their chapter Monday through Friday. One chapter in the morning and one chapter in the evening. And when the enemy comes to take that word, Come on, they don't cough up the rock. Come on. They hold on to that. And even though the pressures are coming, it produces 30, 60, 100 fold. Now you see them growing and getting better and better than they've ever been. Psalm 107.20 says this. uh, He says, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them of their destruction. If you have been or are going through any kind of trouble, always know God has sent you a word. Because that's how you get out of the trouble. He'll give you a word. You know, some of us are looking for God to give us the money, but all he wants to give you is a word. Because if you grab hold of that word, you'll get the money. He sent his word. I love how he says it in this. God is a word God. Amen. Notice what he says in Isaiah 55, 11. He says, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. 
it shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish whatever I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I have sent it. The it in this verse is the word of God. Amen. Notice God's words goes forth out of his mouth. It doesn't come back to him empty. If he has said no weapon formed against you shall prosper, then it doesn't matter if it looks like it's prospering. If you hold on to that word, the word will work. But you might say, well, pastor, I've been praying. I've been believing. I've been wanting things to be better. I'm telling you, hold on to the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, I say it like this. Never give up. If you believe in God to have a family, never give up. Amen. If you believe in God to be married, never give up. If you believe in God to get that business off the ground so you don't have to work for somebody else, never give up. If you believe in God for life to be better than it's been, then never give up. You ever been there in an office cubicle but somebody had the picture of a frog that was swallowed by a stork? Come on, somebody. I've been that frog. Come on. And if if you've never seen it, if you can imagine a stork's mouth, you know, he's got a big old sack in his mouth and he's eating a frog. But the frog got his hand out of the mouth and he's choking. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> the frog got the hand out of the mouth and he's choking the neck of the, of the stork as long as he don't let go. <laughs> the stork's eyes are real big. Come on. In a minute, you will have to let it go. And that's how you do with the devil. You grab hold of God's word and you don't let go. You... The enemy is just waiting because he knows he's coming to try to take. And they endure before time. Now, normally they, they'll give up and they'll let go. But after a while, he'll leave you alone until another season. Last one on this is Second uh, Timothy chapter 2, uh, chapter 4. <clears throat> and verse 2 <clears throat> notice what Paul says to Timothy preach y'all help me preach the what preach the word that, that, I mean your illustration about the word is nice that, that helps us understand it but make sure that you're preaching the word amen be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Praise God. And then last but not least, Romans chapter 10 and verse number eight. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Now, check this out. I don't have time. To go through every passage of scripture that has the phrase, the word in it. But it is abundant. You can go through, I mean, like I mean, every, all of these that we've seen have indicated. So what does that say? You receiving the word of God is very important to God. And so that's who we are as a church family. And that's what I'm challenging you to be, is to be a person of the word. So if you're visiting for the first time and you're checking us out, then I hope you could check the box. They're a word church. Amen. And if you're not yet a word person, I pray that you've heard something today that will encourage you to ratchet up on your list of core value. What do you value in life above everything? I value God's word being spoken to me. Amen. All right, so number one, we are a word church. And then number two, we are a faith church. Yeah. Say that out loud. We're a faith church. A faith church. So in Romans, 8, in Romans chapter 10, verse 8, he says, But what saith that the word is neither even in thy mouth? That is the word of faith which we preach. Yeah. The word is actually the word of faith. Yeah. So the second thing that... We identify as core to who we are. I mean, it's a part of our name. 
we're purposefully called Faith Family Church. Now, obviously, family is important, but notice we're not family faith church. Amen. Notice that we're, even though church is important, we're not the church of family and faith. No, we are what? Faith. Why is that? Because faith is, is a core value to us. You say, well, where do you get that from, Pastor? Well, there are four reasons why faith is extremely important for every believer. It begins in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38. The Bible says, now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my my soul, God says, has no pleasure in him. Notice the Bible says that the just, those who have been declared righteous, not that they are righteous, but they have been declared righteous. Those that have been declared righteous shall live, how, come on, by faith. Now, he's actually quoting something that was first spoken in the Old Testament. This one statement is repeated four times throughout the Bible. He's saying that the just, those who have been born again, they are to live, how? By faith. That means you're supposed and I'm supposed to do everything I do by faith. That alone makes understanding faith extremely important. If I'm supposed to live by it, that means I'm supposed to love my wife by faith. That means I'm, I got one year. Amen. Thank you. I'm supposed to raise my kids by faith. I'm supposed to work on my job by faith. I'm supposed to serve God by faith. I'm supposed to pay my bills by faith. I'm supposed to receive my healing manifested by faith. Everything I do. See, just like if you take a fish out of water, they won't, they'll struggle to live. Is that right? I'm telling you, I did it. I like the fish. Haven't been fishing in a long time. Matter of fact, probably last time I went fishing was Brother Ricky and uh, Brother Raheem. We went uh, like four hours off the coast and caught red snapper. Really cool. But, you know, you get that big old fish out of that water and me immediately you take a fish out. (laughs) Come on. All of a sudden they're struggling and you can let them flap, flap, flap. And you can watch them for a while. They'll they'll start really. (laughs) What's happening? They're not doing well. Why? Because a fish. How does a fish live? They live by water. You take them out of water, they'll struggle to live and possibly will die. You take a believer out of faith and they'll struggle to live. Some of you in your marriages are. You're not doing this right. You are out of the very element. Didn't you know what we do to, you know, when our finances, we're struggling in our finances? Because why? We're trying to work for a living. No, man. God provides all of our needs. Amen. We put our faith and trust in Him, not in our ability to get it. It just revolutionizes your thinking. So there's four reasons why faith is extremely important. Number one, so now obviously I could literally do an entire series on the word. I could literally do an entire series or multiple series on faith. But I'm just wetting your appetite, especially if you're visiting, just to let you know what kind of church we are. In, 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 a, in, a, in a year, you're going to hear messages that really emphasize the Word of God. In a year, you'll hear some series that are just specific to faith. Amen? Now, let me give you the other three reasons quickly why faith is important. Number one, it's important because that's how we're required to live. We've got to live by faith. Number two, it's important because it's how God operates. It is how God himself operates. He operates by faith. Where do you get that from, Pastor Stan? In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3, he said, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, 
so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So notice he said, by faith. Somebody said faith. faith. Now, he's talking about the worlds. They were framed by God. Where do we have in the Bible anything that talks about God framing worlds? Well, the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heaven and what else? And the earth. Now, is the earth the only planet in our solar system? Are there other worlds out there? Essentially, if we call the, the earth the world in which we live, then there's Pluto and Jupiter and Mars, and they are not inhabited as far as we know. But essentially, when God set the stars and the firmament in their axis, when he created the universe, he did that how? Come on, y'all help me. He did it by faith. Now, faith speaks into the darkness and it creates amen and we know that he said light be boom and it was he he spoke the moon into existence the stars to its existence now the bible teaches us that we are to imitate god like dear children if god operates by faith and we are his children how should we operate that's the second reason why it makes faith extremely important. Number three. Number three is in verse six. Verse six says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. So notice the third reason why faith is extremely important to every one of us. It's because without faith, we can't please God. And there ought to be something on the inside of every single one of us that wants to please our Heavenly Father. In the natural, I want my dad to be pleased with my life. I don't want him ever to look at me as a failure. That would, that would touch my natural life. And you know what I mean? And in the same way, instinctively, in every one of us, there's something that wants to please God. That's why when we do something we're not supposed to do, Come on, y'all help me now. When we say something and we know that God's not pleased with that, it touches us. In other words, I can't be comfortable with evil. You want to know why it bothers you to do wrong? Because you know that God created you and God is good. Oh, man. God is good. Hallelujah. And so it's important then. That you understand that faith is how you please God, not your perfection. See, you can mess up again and again and still be pleasing to God. If it it was about our perfection, then God wouldn't have used David. If it was about our perfection, then God wouldn't have used Abraham. If it would have it was if it was about being perfect, God wouldn't have been able to use Moses or Noah. All of them are men just like us, and they've messed up even worse than some of us. But God used them because they've had faith. Like God, even though I know I've blessed, messed up and I've blown it big, I believe that you're faithful to your word. And you can turn my life into something that's better than it's been. And then last but not least, faith is, imp- is important because it's how we access grace. Through whom also we have access by faith Into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, if faith is the big subject of the Bible, grace is the big subject of the New Testament. So number three, we are a grace church. If you could go back and put that one up for me. So what kind of church are we? Help me out. A word church, help me out, a faith church, and then number three, we're what? A grace church. Now, throughout time, churches get a revelation and then they get into a ditch. So, for example, there are churches that are word churches, but are not faith churches. I mean, they are word, word, word. You know, as far as they know, they're really big about the word, but they're not really big about faith. Can't see how you can be big about the word and not be big about faith because... 
It's the word of faith. Amen. But not every church is a faith, faith, faith church. Right. Some churches are grace churches. Amen. We are a grace church as well as a faith church. Amen. Where do you connect that? We connect it from what it said in in Romans five. It says how you access grace is by faith. That's why that's the fourth reason why faith is important. But being a grace church, why is grace important? Oh, you're going to love this. And I only got two other scriptures after this one. And then we'll be done. Amen. So watch this. In Ephesians chapter two, verse eight. He says, for by grace, you have been what? Saved through what? Faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, man, this is a power packed verse of scripture. He says here that it is by grace. Do you know what the grace of God is? Let me help you. Justice is when you get what you deserve. Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. Grace is when you get something that you don't deserve. One of the simplest ways to define grace is unmerited favor. It's some some favor God has bestowed on you that you didn't deserve. And it's so important because none of us deserve anything from God. None of us deserve a promotion. None None of us deserve a peaceful marriage. None of us deserve a healthy body. Well, pastor, don't you deserve some things because you went to ministry school and you live your life to help people? Yeah, those are the good things I've done, but you don't know the bad things I've done. You don't know the nasty things that I've done. You don't know the wickedness that my hands have been involved in. But by the grace of God, I stand before you today. And it's the same. So understanding grace is extremely important. Why is it important? Notice, it's by grace that you got saved. I know it's through faith, but it's by grace. Now put this together. See, faith is how you access grace. It's by grace you have been saved, but how you accessed salvation was by having faith. Faith accessed the grace of salvation in your life. Notice this. He says it's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Verse 9 says it's not of works lest any man should what boast. What is he saying? It's not of works. What that means is with all the faith in the world, you can only access grace. See, your faith doesn't obtain the healing. It just access the healing that he already gave you. You don't use your faith to get a job. I used, I used to, I was taught that way because I was in a faith church and I had to believe for everything, right? Because a fish lives by water. So if you need a new car, you got to believe God for the car. But you know what grace says? Grace says God has already given you all things that pertain to life. So in the heart and mind of God, in the spiritual reality of God, everything you need, he's already given it to you. So how do you access it? You access the grace. You access what he's given you by believing that it's already yours. Woo, man. I know this is kind of. But I close with these two verses. In 1 Corinthians 15 and 10, it says this, but by grace, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. My challenge to you, child of God, as we go through this series Yes, find out who we are as a church, especially if you're visiting. Amen. And if you see already that that you're in the right place, then come on, be a part of the faith family. But as we're going through this, I challenge you, 
Ask yourself, who am I as a person? Because I, I know personally for me, I'm a word person. I need a word from God. I need to hear from God. When I get up tomorrow, I'm going to read my chapters. But not only that, I'm going to listen to somebody preach. I might listen to myself preach. Amen. But I'm going to listen to somebody because I need. Come on. Jesus said, I got food to eat that you don't even know about. Man can't live by bread alone. That's going back to that fish illustration. You can't live without eating, right? Just like you can't live out of water if you're a fish. So I challenge you, be a word person. You don't say, well, you know, this church doesn't really fit me. Well, I pray when you go to find another church, make sure that they're feeding you the word of God, right? Another thing is make sure that they're feeding you the spirit of faith. And then the third thing is make sure it's a grace church. That it's not by works, but it's by the grace of God. Amen. Last but not least, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9, it says this. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. How many grace people do I have in here today? Amen. Praise God. So what kind of church are we? What kind of person are you? How many of you all excited about this new series that we're going to go through? Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Facebook, for being on live. We'll see you next time. God bless you. Amen.